Welcome to the video lecture series, Culture, Worldview, and Origins. We are Tim and Holly Nyquist. We have lived cross-culturally in Bolivia 25 years. The last 18 of those 25 teach in culture anthropology at the university level. <clears throat> in the private university, it was a good experience. I felt comfortable and, and felt I was effective. Then I went over to the state university and all that changed. I struggled, my students struggled, the homework wasn't being able to get done, the test scores were low, what happened? Um, I was not in a position to, to really understand the context, to understand what happened, uh, but at the same time, I was required to earn a Bolivian degree. And it was during that process of studying for that Bolivian degree that I began understanding what is going on. I was now a student in their educational system. I was being educated and I understood now how they educated. It took me about a year. I was frustrated. I was, uh, didn't know what to expect, didn't know what to do. It was a difficult experience the first year, which I, I think it, it probably was much like my students' experience at the State University. They were frustrated. They were they struggled, and that's exactly what I was doing. And I was, I was struggling. And so then I started looking back and I thought, well, then what happened at the private university? Must have been the private university, must have been then closer to my home culture, must have been closer to um, how I learned, and therefore how I teach. Whereas in the state university, there has got to be a cultural difference. And, and that's after studying and researching and actually after applying the uh, research that I needed to do for my degree to my context, to my actual problem, we came up with uh, a, a number of, of possibilities. And uh, that's what we want to go over in this video series. As part of the <clears throat> The on-campus at the State University, we had an on-campus resource library. The library was for the students to do their, their homework, their research at, and so it had, it had books, it had videos, it had magazines, it had articles. On the weekends, we would do excursions. Bolivia is a beautiful country. We would, uh, it, it has from the, the humid Amazon to the arid Andes and everywhere in between. And uh, we would go out on an excursion on the weekends. And that's partially why the, the address uh, Double Road Rover, it was our rover that took us around. And uh, Bolivia being rich in uh, cultural diversity and in fossil fuels, we often came back with uh, shards of ceramic, pieces of ceramic, uh, ceramics that were hundreds of years old, or um, fossils that were who knows how old. But anyway, that added to the uh, inventory, the artifacts into our office, and students would come and handle the artifacts, read up on the books and the articles about them, and then do the reports for whatever class they had. Sometimes a full class would come and they would request a, a lecture. Now I was, through my, my studying now for, for this degree, it was a degree of philosophy of education, I was studying a lot of philosophers, and so I started questioning different people's philosophy um, that were writers, that were writing the books that were in my office. And uh, so I had one book, and it was, a, it was a children's book. It was very well illustrated, and it was, uh, the name of it was uh, Fossil's Tale of Long Ago by Aliki. And uh, so the, the class would come in, sit down, and I would ask him about the book. I would say, uh, true or false, Fossil's Tale of Long Ago. And usually, true, 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 all the hands would go up. Why? Well, because the professor has the book, and it's printed, and it's on the blackboard, so it must be true. It's, it's true. So then I would ask for a volunteer to come forward. Usually it would be a young man in the back row or something. He'd come up and I'd say, uh, I need your help for a minute. He'd say, sure, what do you need? And I said, here, here's, here's a fossil, okay? Now I want you to listen to it and then you tell me what it tells you so I can tell them. He would kind of look at me, all right. So he would take it and listen to it. Nothing. I said, what did it tell you? What did it tell you? What did it say? 
And he said, nothing. I said, why? He said, it's a rock. Rocks can't talk. I said, okay. Um, you raised your hand, right? Fossils tell of long ago? Yeah. I said, is that title true or false? Oh, okay. I said, and if it is false, what's false about the title? Is it long ago? Should it be short ago? Or ago, no mas, or, or something? And he would say, no, it's, it's tell. Uh, the fossils don't tell us anything. And so that, that got me on to uh, developing this schematic or this diagram about really what is the process and how do we get reliable knowledge? How do we get knowledge and facts? Well, here we have a question mark. Question mark is about fossils, about dinosaurs, maybe about us. Um, the, the world has a, a lot of questions. So what we do is we invite a, an authority to come in and he or she will study the data and then give us the conclusion of what the data wants to tell us, of what it means. And so now I was starting to understand how this works. Input, output, facts. Okay, so that's how we get our books and our videos and our scientific articles. An object is studied by an authority that then tells us and publishes the facts. Well, I'm, I'm reading, still researching for my degree, and I'm reading more about philosophy and philosophers, and I ran across this guy, Frederick Nitschke. He says, facts are precisely what there is not, only interpretations. Ooh. That, that at first came across kind of, boom, shock, kind of like a relativist, but then it started to resonate a little bit. Why? Well, it's because I'm starting to see what he might be saying is that the process here is that we don't get straight to, it's not a straight dialogue with the object. It's an object with a mediator in between that's telling us what it wants to say. And so Nitschke is saying, Facts are precisely what there is not, only interpretations. So that this guy's interpretation then is not necessarily a fact. It's an, his interpretation of the data. Huh, okay, interesting. So that started kind of in my mind turning over and I was sitting there, okay. Then I ran across another one, but this one's by a scientist. And this is Stephen Jay Gould now deceased, but he said, first facts do not come to us as objective items seen in the same unambiguous way by all reasonable people. I know it's a mouthful, but all reasonable people do not see facts the same way. So what he's saying is that, okay, you can be reasonable, but you may not agree with the way I see it. But then he goes in and he lists four factors why we may not see it all the same way. He says, theory, habit, prejudice, and culture all influence the facts we choose to observe and the way in which we perceive them, observe them. Now I was fascinated by that because culture, he lists culture as one of the influencing major factors of of influencing how we perceive things. And now I had just been through a whole series of, of dynamics in education that had to do with culture. And so now I was studying culture and how culture influenced education. And now he says culture influences how a scientist, how anybody even really sees reality and perceives it. And so this has now started kind of generating in my mind um, some ideas, because I was interested in the origins debate, but not as a debate. I just wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know which ones, are, there are like six models of origins out there, and it's each one proposes their own evidence, but their own evidence is proposed by their own people. So it's, 
their own people that their theory, habit, and prejudice and culture are interpreting the evidence, but I still wanted to know what's behind it all. Well, now I'm starting to understand saying, wow, okay, it's theory, habit, prejudice, and culture that could be behind how we see the world. Well, back to this image now, I changed things a little bit. Yeah, we have questions. Yeah, the world is there. Yeah, the expert comes in, <coughs> but it's not an input-output. The output is a colored line that is now jagged and influenced by the theory, habit, prejudice, and culture of the lenses of, of, the, of the authority that is interpreting. So now it's an interpreter. And living cross-culturally, we've dealt with interpreters. Uh, we've had teams come, medical teams, what, we need an interpreter. And you know what? There's some fascinating interpretations that have come out. It's not all literal, direct. And, and so in other words, you have to watch who your interpreter is and make sure that they understand the, the original language uh, to go back and to put it into the, the native language. So it was, it's an interesting process, but what this means is that the scientist is an interpreter. And now I understand. I've seen interpreters, I've interpreted, okay. It's my criteria that influences how I interpret something. And so now um, I'm starting to see, wow, what would the origins debate look like? Not a debate. What would the origin scientific models comparison look like analyzing it through theory, habit, prejudice, and culture? Fascinating. Okay, that is the objective of this series of videos. One, we're gonna start with culture. Looking at culture and studying culture, I've come up with 21 different cognitive thinking characteristics, differences between me, a Westerner, and me, my students, non-Westerners. 21 different characteristics that influence the way we think that that way that we think was molded by our context, our cultural context, cultivated by our cultural context. So first we look at that, who's that for? Anybody that's interested in culture, anybody that wants to understand culture, anybody that wants to understand if they're in a cross-cultural situation, whether it be a teacher, student, whether it be a, a, a client, whether it be a neighbor, um, look it over and, and, and compare it and then enter in dialogue, send us, talk to us about your experience. That's why we have here Double Road Rover, the rover again is what took us there. Double road is, is kind of like, well, there's, there's a, an unconscious development of our thinking pattern, which gives us a bias. And then there's the um, conscious development of the worldview that then is a conscious development based on our beliefs and, and theories. And based on that prejudice, then we have a practice which is our origins, where we believe we came from. Now, I, I believe that to be a very important uh, topic to really have, have struggled with um, because what we believe about where we came from is pretty much going to decide or determine what's our belief about where we go when we're all done here. <clears throat> so the importance of this series is uh, I, I think it, it hits a lot of people in that first we start with culture. There's gonna be 21 points of contrast between my Western and, and my friend's non-Western culture and how that has influenced our educational, my educational practice. Then based on that, we go to worldview. Worldview then is a, is a cognitive, is a thinking development based on my bias of my, my culture. Then I develop my theories my prejudices and my habits in a worldview. We're gonna look at worldview and compare it to philosophy also. Then we take those two building blocks and we look at origins. Origins will be the last series that we, we, we go through and we're gonna compare two major scientific models. We're gonna compare the Darwinian evolutionary model to the Hebrew creation science model. Uh, interesting to uh, enter into dialogue with those two models based on what is theory, habit, prejudice, and culture as listed by Stephen Jay Gould.
Thanks for joining me. Hope that you, uh, you enjoyed the time that you come back. And if you can, you have time to enter into dialogue, conversation with us, it's at doubleroadrover.com is the blog spot. You can enter in blogging. Or email direct, thn.academia at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you soon.